We're going to get into Herodotus just a little bit more, and so we are taking a look at Greece here and Persia, the end of the Old Testament, which is bumping up into the end of Daniel. Uh, we're going to get into Darius and then Xerxes, Artaxerxes, and then into Ezra, Esther, Nehemiah, and th these are contemporaries of Herodotus. So you, you have to understand this is fabulous. So Darius the Persian, Darius one the Great, we have this one little bit in Daniel chapter 6, as pleased Darius to set over the kingdom 120 princes, which would be over the whole kingdom, and over these three presidents of whom Daniel was first. So here we have Daniel living quite a long time, because remember Darius the Great, Darius I, started his reign in 521 B.C., 521 B.C., and that means that Daniel lived a very long time, and maybe even knew Ezra and Esther. We know the popular stories. This is actually where Daniel in the lion's den comes in, and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. But we're not going to go there. We're going to go into these contemporaries, because we're getting into the 480s, which is when Herodotus was born. Because let's look at our, our map again. Herodotus, 484 to 425. We can see him right here. And when we get into the time scale now of Darius the Great, we're talking 486. You see that? So Darius becomes king, appoints Daniel as one of the presidents, and Herodotus is born, because that'd be 484. And then Ezra is detailing the return of Israel from Babylon, and he's writing in the 480s to the 440s. Well, it's in the 440s that Herodotus is writing his work, The History. So all of these interconnections are fabulous. So let's zoom out from here. We'll go over to about the time of Herodotus and the Greeks. Let's move our arrow over to where Herodotus actually lived. He was around during the time of the Archons of Athens, because that gets us into about 486, 485, 484. So when Herodotus was born in Halicarnassus, probably Leostratus or Nicodemus was the Archon of Athens. But I'm going to leave that, that arrow right there, because that gives us the big picture now. When we zoom out, we can see our perspective. Now, this is the Greeks interaction with the Hebrews and then the, the interactions with the Persians. I'm going to move this Persian arrow down, too. Because we're not just talking about Assyria, Babylonia, Chaldea, Medes. Now we're talking about Persians specifically. So I'm moving that arrow, too, to give us some perspective of the time in history. See, it's, it's like it's a long time ago, but then when you see it this way, it's not like it's so long ago. And then, because we get such detail, it isn't like they're so different. Enter Xerxes I and Esther, contemporaries of Herodotus. Herodotus and Esther are probably young here. So here's Darius I, the Great. We're going to end him off. Now on our map here, we see that the Greeks are the next in line that Darius wants to take over. So he launches an assault against the Greeks. There is a lot of detail on this war. It's very interesting about the lining up of ships so he can get his troops across here. This is a very treacherous place in Greece to try to attack because of this mountainous seafaring area. You have to have a navy and an army. It's, it's a little bit complex to do. We have this Battle of Marathon. Well, Phaedipides is a runner who sees that the Persians are going to be attacking Greece. And so I'm going to zoom up in there just a little bit. A lot of this attack comes on this eastern side of Greece, and Athens is about here. Corinth of the Bible is about right here. The Peloponnese right here. Sparta in there. The Persians are attacking, and Phaedipides knows that the Greeks are in dire straits. So he runs from Athens to Sparta 140 miles, tells the army, and then he dies. He has consumed his body's life just by doing this run. So the Athenians are notified, and they can do something about this onslaught, so they march their army 25 miles to head off the Persians, which they successfully do. Now this is 
the Battle of Marathon in 490 BC. This is where we get our word for marathon. And that 25 mile march is turned into a, about a 26 mile race. Well, that would have been Darius the Great doing that. He doesn't make it much longer after that when then Xerxes I comes to the throne. Xerxes I that we know about from the Hebrew record, and we hear a bit about him through Ezra and Esther, because Esther calls him Ahasuerus. So we'll change our map up again, and now our center becomes the Xerxes I, Ahasuerus, to reign from 486 to 465. And we can read in the first part of Esther, the book of Esther now, that now it came to pass in the days of Ahasuerus, this is Ahasuerus, which reigned from India even unto Ethiopia, over 107 and 20 provinces, that in those days when the king Ahasuerus sat on the throne of his kingdom, which was at Shushan, the palace. It's also called Susa, the capital of the Persian Empire. It's a little bit east of Babylon, and because of the power of Darius and Xerxes, they build a royal road that goes right up this way through all these trade networks into Turkey across the north part of Turkey and comes down about where Herodotus is born, about Halicarnassus. So that's what it seemed to me, you know, it's a, it's approximate, but that was called the royal road. So this is part of the um, connection point, which happens right here, right here in the Bible, where we constantly in Sunday school from ages past, we hear about Daniel and the lion's den and, and Esther and so on. And then it's right here where this is connecting. This is causing the connection points of all civilization. And it's right before our nose, but we just don't get some of this detail unless we read into Herodotus, which is fascinating. But when you look at this map also, you see this Xerxes I that his kingdom it says it reigned from India all the way to Ethiopia. And that is so amazing because this is the whole, whole lead up of all these events that are happening with Taharqa and Egypt and Neko 1 and Neko 2. And so then we see this map, which is, which is huge. I mean, there's Bactria and the Sakas and the Parthians, the Medians. I mean, all these cultures have been subsumed into this huge empire. And none of them can do anything because he, he just say, well, I want 10,000 troops from each one of my cities that I have allied with or made pacts with. Any one place cannot muster enough troops to go against him. Just massive resources. He's like this guy that just can't be beat until the Greco-Persian Wars. So there Herodotus is right in the middle of those wars, becomes very curious about them, and then writes his series of books. There is a statue of Herodotus, and he has his book there in his hand. He is contemporary with Ezra, Esther, Nehemiah, and that's about where the Old Testament ends. The end of the Old Testament is here with Haggai, with Zechariah. We can go down a little bit. Malachi. Ezra, and Nehemiah. So Nehemiah is where the chronology of the Old Testament ends, and it ends with the return to Jerusalem after the wall of Jerusalem is finished in 444 BC. And then anyone who could return returns up into 425 BC. That Herodotus is writing the same time the wall in Jerusalem is being finished. See, he has some things here. I, I think they're interesting. Um, in book one and two is talking about maybe winged serpents, which I get the idea of maybe ter pterodactyls. Not far from the town of Buto, there is a place in Arabia to which I went to learn about the winged serpents. And when I came thither, I saw innumerable bones and backbones of serpents. Many heaps of backbones there were, great and small and smaller still, and then on, Herodotus writes, winged serpents are said to fly at the beginning of spring from Arabia, making for Egypt. Another fascination. And then when we look at the actual description that Herodotus gives for them, you see, their wings are not feathered, but most like the wings of a bat. These fascinating jewels in here. Um, some other things. They knew that the Atlantic and Red Sea were joined. Well, look at this. Let's zoom out on our map. Look at this. Most historians will say, well, like, th these guys didn't know very much outside of the Mediterranean. 
But there is Solomon in 970, 979, 30 BC that talks about sending ships around Africa. And we're talking about the 900s BC. So now when Herodotus, he sees here in the 450s, he has this. Beyond the pillars of Hercules, well that's right here between Spain and Morocco, uh, the Strait of Gibraltar. See, he says, there's some sea out there which they call the Atlantic. And the Red Sea, Red Sea over here by Egypt, are all one, but the Caspian is separate and by itself. So he's talking about this. See, look at this. They think, Herodotus is saying, see, there's water all the way around here that the Red Sea is connected to the Mediterranean Sea. And that is incredible stuff. These are the jewels Herodotus brings to the table here. And here's another one where we'll get a little bit more close to Europe, because he's talking about a river here that goes through into, um, into the middle of Europe, which is the Danube. And, and it says, that river flows from the land of the Celte and the city of Pyrene through the very midst of Europe. Now the Celte dwell beyond the pillars of Hercules, being neighbors of the Cynesi, who are the westernmost of all nations inhabiting Europe. The pillars of Hercules again. You know the Celte are over here, but he also knows that they might be able to get through them through the Black Sea, through this other river. Well, how can you do that? He's, he's trying to connect this in his mind, and it's just amazing to, to see him trying to do that. See, here's the, you know, oh, that's where he talks about it. Read a little bit more into Herodotus. The Ister then flows clean across Europe and ends its course in the Yuxing Sea. And the Yuxing Sea is the Black Sea. So these are these amazing connection points. They knew of the Celts at this time. That's amazing. See, he's Greek. We, we don't see that in the Hebrew histories. We do see that in the Grecian histories because you, you just have this radius, this transportation threshold that's hard to get through. And so here at the time of Esther, at the time of Nehemiah, at the time of Herodotus, we also have this mapping that they knew they could get around Africa, they knew they could get to the Celts, some distant bunch of people over in the West past the Pillars of Hercules. Amazing. So they're just, um, I'll just show another, you know, it's just incredible what you can get out of, maybe you find the jackpot of research and take a nosedive into it, and that's how it is when you can put Herodotus right there next to the end of the Old Testament history. So I'll just go talk about a couple other jewels that Herodotus talks about. Uh, there's one where he's talking about Hesiod and Homer. Homer's very important because he wrote the Iliad and the Odyssey, and, and it's thought he's something like uh, 800s or 700s, something like that. Here's Herodotus just making a gander at it. He says, those guys were not more than 400 years before my own time. His own time? Well, you know, 400s. Okay, now go back 400 years to the 800s. Okay, maybe 700s, maybe you know, not more than, not more than 400 years. So that's interesting about Homer. And then, and then there's some interesting things in Herodotus talking about the Trojan War. A lot of the ancient cultures did ancestor worship. I think that's, a, you know, these Greek gods are a form of that. Uh, so you have here Penelope and Hermes, parents of Pan. You know, so he, Herodotus is trying to date them, but he's actually dating them older than the Trojan War. And he's putting them that 800 years before his time is older than the date of the Trojan War. That little detail about the Trojan War that would put it at about 1200, something like that. And when you go in here where Eusebius named the Trojan War, we get 1190, I think. Yeah, 1190 BC or maybe 1183 BC. Agamemnon's rule. So that is uh, my calculation and also a calculation by Eusebius. We're not outside the bounds of reason here. Because Herodotus is saying the Trojan War was closer to him than 1200 BC. And Herodotus goes down here to Tyre and Sidon. He gets another story about Helen. We have this really fun excerpt that talks about Helen, a Helen that launched a thousand ships between the Greeks and Troy, ushering in the Trojan War. 
shows how he with Helen was carried out of his course among other places to Sidon of Phoenicia, which was the place of the Phoenicians, Tyre and Sidon. That's uh, right north of Israel, around where Lebanon is. So we get this other detail of Herodotus pondering about the Iliad and the Odyssey and learning things that he thought were provocative and interesting, and he put them in his book, trying to think back and reconstruct his world. Just amazing. Isn't that amazing? So the Greco-Persian War, 499 to 449. We have the Peloponnesian War, 431 to 404. And then we have the Philip and Alexander War, 350s to the 300s, just about. And that is after Herodotus' time. But remember, Socrates was born 469. Going to zoom in here now to the Greek part of this. Maybe 469, 470, something like that. 399 BC. That means Socrates is alive during the time of Herodotus. Socrates says, True wisdom comes to each of us when we realize how little we understand about life, ourselves, and the world around us. Plato. Plato was around right there at the end of the Old Testament, which is right there at 425 BC. Nehemiah ends with the wall being built, Jews going back to Jerusalem, 425. See, this is Plato being born, 428. Socrates, no Plato, Herodotus, Nehemiah are contemporaries. So Socrates didn't write, but Plato did write down his words. He's a little bit later, Plato 428 to 348. We get Platonic from Plato, and then we get Academic from Plato, because Academos was the place where Plato taught his students. It was Hero Academus. There is a depiction of Hero Academus of Plato. Plato taught Aristotle, 384, 322. Remember, this is just right after the Old Testament. And then Aristotle taught Alexander the Great. Isn't this outrageous? We can tag Greek thinking onto the end of the Old Testament. It's like it weaves together, and this is the core of Western thought. It's this Grecian Jewish thought, or Hebrew Grecian thought. It's coming together here because there's a void in prophecy after Malachi and Nehemiah. That's where we get the apocryphal books, which you can read about getting into the Maccabean Revolution. But we don't hear a lot about that in the Protestant church, and then we pick up at the life of Herod and Jesus. and we, So that's getting into the first century AD. We can change our perspectives now. Alexander the Great is going to go back here. Remember, all these cities are paying taxes because they don't want to go head-to-head -head with Persia. But Alexander takes this on. Alexander the Great here can say, you're going to pay taxes to Persia or to me? They say, well, you know, whoever wins. So Alexander the Great, his army is just stomping right back through all of here. They end up down in Israel. And this is not really something that... Uh, I was taught, I was just reading in Josephus, and I was just baffled by this passage I came across. And it centered on Israel, because Josephus was talking about Israel. But it talked about Alexander the Great going to Jerusalem, because he's liberating Tyre and Sidon and all these different places. So he marches down here. He's got to march over the whole Persian Empire, which that's going to be going down in Greek, uh, Egypt a little bit, and come up here to Iraq, Iran, what we think of, and then over, over to Persia, and then all the way to, to India, because we see him going to Bactria in the uh, kind of like Af Afghanistan area, and down into India. Uh, but while he's over here in, well, what would you call it? L the Levant, let's just say. He's over here in the Levant now, this place that has been people's displaced over and over again. Alexander the Great is here, his one of his chief military men is Parmenio, and we have the priest of Jerusalem. So this is past Herodotus then. So this is going into the shadow of the Persian Empire, but the sunrise of the Greek Empire. And Josephus, 80 or 90 AD, he's writing this of Alexander the Great. About this time it was that Philip, king of Macedon, was treacherously assaulted and slain at Egei by Pausanias, the son of Serastus, who was derived from the family of Oresti. 
And his son, Alexander, succeeded him in the kingdom, who, passing over the Hellespont, overcame the generals of Darius' army in a battle fought at Granicum. So he marched over Lydia and subdued Ionia, and overran Caria, and fell upon the places of Pamphylia, as has been related elsewhere. Some of those names, you can see them still there. Phrygia, Lydia, and then you can see them just in the flags here. Phrygia, Cappadocia, Paphlagonia, uh, Macedonia. Remember, uh, that's north of Greece. So Alexander is tromping over this land. Then he comes to Israel. So this is what we have in Josephus again. This is where Parmenio comes from. It's, it's in Josephus. And as he's going along here, everybody's going to go along with Alexander. He's the big force now. Um, so they're kind of kissing up to him. And they're also trying to get in his good favor so they can hurt the other cities that are around them. So you have people of Tyre and Sidon that are, that are going as a flock with them, thinking, yeah, let's go down there and get Jerusalem. So here's Alexander looking at Jerusalem. So Alexander, when he saw the multitude at a distance in white garment, while the priests stood clothed with fine linen, and the high priests in purple and scarlet clothing, with his mitre on his head, having the golden plate whereon the name of God was engraved, he approached by himself and adored that name, and first saluted the high priest. The Jews also did all together with one voice salute Alexander and encompassed him about, whereupon the kings of Syria and the rest were surprised at what Alexander had done, and supposed him disordered in his mind. However, Parmenio alone went up to him and asked him how it came to pass that when all others adored him, he should adore the high priest of the Jews, to whom he replied, I did not adore him, but that God who hath honored him with his high priesthood. For I saw this very person in a dream in this very habit when I was at Dios in Macedonia. Here, I'll move my map up and show Macedonia. So, Alexander the Great had a dream here about the exact place in Jerusalem and the exact attire of the priests. So his going into Jerusalem was a fulfillment of the dream he saw, which makes me wonder a lot about God giving dreams to kings. We see that with Daniel and the Magi, but then we see it here with Alexander the Great. That's kind of, kind of an interesting, provocative thought. So Alexander the Great goes on and he says, I was considering with myself how I might obtain the dominion of Asia. Okay, God exhorted me to make no delay, but boldly pass over the sea thither, for that he would conduct my army and would give me the dominion over the Persians. So Alexander the Great is just astonished at this priest here, or these priests, and remembering that vision and the exhortation which I had in my dream, I believe that I bring this army under the divine conduct and shall therewith conquer Darius and destroy the power of the Persians, and that all things will succeed according to what is in my own mind. So here is another astounding detail in Josephus. And when the book of Daniel was showed him, Alexander the Great, wherein Daniel declared that one of the Greeks should destroy the empire of the Persians, he supposed that himself was the person intended, and as he was then glad, he dismissed the multitude for the present. So it goes on, and you can read that, and it talks about the negotiation between the Jews there and Alexander the Great. But is this incredible? So there, Alexander the Great is thinking he has a greater authority to go out and destroy the Persians which he does, but that's talked about in Josephus. So we see the energy waves of the Lord through Daniel again in history, just like Daniel presented Cyrus the Great, the scroll of Isaiah. Now you have the Jews here in Jerusalem presenting Daniel, the book of Daniel, to Alexander the Great. So all of that together just shows something awesome. I think it is incredible. I hope this opens up our eyes to how interconnected the world is. because so We can see that here on the map. This whole yellow place then becomes red. So Alexander the Great goes on just like Daniel had prophesied, and is broken up into pieces. 
Look at how history is just so interconnected. There in the north and there in the Egyptian line. Wow, so do you see that? Do you see how incredible that is? We're just taking a few books and fusing them and seeing how they're interconnected. And just by looking at some of the end books of the Old Testament and Herodotus and then Josephus writing later, we've interwoven how this early history is connected with the Greeks, with the, the Hebrews, with the Assyrians and Babylonians, the Medes and the Persians. Persia went on very far. It's what we call Iran to this day. So I hope that journey was incredible. It was definitely incredible to me seeing these contemporary forces, these uh, um, Socrates, Plato, Aristotle, Alexander the Great, um, um, Pythagoras, earlier than all of them, um, Nehemiah, uh, Herodotus, uh, Hezekiah, and these empires, they just keep on getting bigger and bigger and more accessible because we can go faster. We have airplanes, we have trains. So hopefully this journey was fabulous for you, and I hope it fuses a little bit of Greek thought with Hebrew thought with Persian thought and shows us how interrelated they are. Also, hopefully uh, you get inspired that uh, Herodotus is worth reading as he is called the father of history. So if you have the time to read him, definitely he is a pivotal figure that is well quoted and will continue to be well quoted. Hope your life is blessed. Stay awesome. Stay the best person that you can be. Have a great week and I'll see you in the next video.